Now we have the last but not least speaker. Uh, he's a researcher in, in economics uh, and professor uh, that actu- at Manchester University that we, we had the pleasure to have a speaker a few years ago. And he has been uh, researching a lot about like uh, data sharing frameworks in financial services and, uh, uh, and actually engaging the debate on uh, open banking regulation when Canada actually is trying to know uh, the the regulation they wants to they wants to have is it market driven is it is the regulation need to be really strong so yeah so we'll have this discussion uh, f- with uh, Marcos Zakariadis so I invite you uh, uh, Marcos to join yes you are on stage that's perfect and uh, how are you Marcos yes I'm good Mac thanks a lot for the invitation I think this is the fourth year uh, um, participating at our API days either in yes. London or, or Berlin or even Paris in the past. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, because we think, uh, you know, having uh, researchers is extremely important to uh, keep an eye of what's what's happening and anticipating the future. So we're really glad to have you. And yes, I'll, I'll let you um, alone on stage, right? So you can be uh, present, you can present your uh, research and conclusions on data sharing frameworks in financial services. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Um, hello, everybody. As I said to Mech, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a conference that I've, um, I've, I've had a chance to present and also participate in the past and really joined all interactions with people. Uh, it's so unfortunate uh, due to COVID, we, we're not able to be together physically at the same place, but hopefully uh, this virtual um, uh, kind of environment will enable us to exchange a little bit of information and, and learn a bit more about uh, one another. What I'm going to do today is basically present a little bit around the research we've done um, on data sharing and financial services. We have been looking at open banking as a big case study uh, on what it takes to really create a data sharing infrastructure um, in an industry which is especially banking sector and financial services heavily regulated. You know, it's a very interesting kind of case study for us uh, who study the role of data or the strategic role of data uh, and, and its role in competition overall. Um, I'm just going to present um, a kind of a smaller overview of what we've done in the past as well at the firm level, and then also kind of finish up with some recommendations um, about regulators, how they can think about data sharing uh, models, let's say, and what are the things that they have to look into if they're keen to put out um, an infrastructure around data sharing, for example, in their own country and context. So I'm going to start a little bit, you know, obviously some um, very basic kind of ideas, uh, data sharing, and I hope you can see my my slides here. Data sharing, it, it's not really new in financial services. So we have had um, data sharing through open or external APIs for quite some time. We have, for example, a lot of uh, payment solutions integrated into e-commerce uh, platforms, uh, for example, or even within applications, right? In-app purchasing, for example, uh, implementations in particular applications applications, mobile applications is something that we have seen really picking up pace um, even the last few years. And generally speaking, there's a lot of um, innovation in this space, you know, considering big tech companies like P- uh, PayPal or Amazon, they have implemented, you know, uh, programs where they have developers in, in even kind of implement their solutions into their own services and so on and so forth. So not something um, really new in that sense. And also even beyond APIs, data sharing has happened before through uh, Uh, screen scraping processes and applications, you know, what we call terminal emulation, for example, as a way to capture data that it's in closed systems, right? And extract these data out of closed systems and bring it back to consumers to to make it as a valuable asset of value information for them uh, and their decision-making, right? Also as part of a customer's, for example, uh, value that they can consume from the information that they have, uh, for example, in a banking portal, uh, you know, extracting these uh, information, uh, be it kind of account information, transactional information, or other information on different uh, products they may have with that particular bank has been deemed kind of like a valuable way uh, to, to generate kind of value for consumers. And again, you know, debates around the uh, suitability of different technologies um, have been at the forefront uh, of discussions within the industry and also amongst regulators. We had, for example, the classic debate between screen scraping and APIs as being uh, kind of like uh, two major uh, alternatives. 
for um, consuming data from closed systems. And for that, even we had a new breed of companies or platform companies who kind of mediated this, uh, this interaction between kind of closed systems and, and kind of third parties who wish to get access to these data. So these, um, uh, what, whatever the case of technology that can be used in the context of data sharing, the question or the big kind of idea there is that, of course, lack of access to data in a particular uh, setting, for example, creates a distorted competition, right? And we have evidence from many different sectors, uh, but of course, also from the banking sector. And, and just to bring back uh, to your memory, this very early report from 2014 that was done by the o ODIE, um, uh, OGI and, and the Fingleton Associates, where it kind of proved or, you know, put forward the case that because of the uh, uh, little data openness within the banking sector in the UK, we have seen, for example, uh, consumers not really enjoying the best prices, the best quality, and there is high switching costs. And that also creates uh, essentially uh, a bad environment for new entrants who wish to enter the sector, and that does not kind of allow for health competition um, in the industry. And so regulators have these kind of uh, uh, debates at heart these days. Um, and if you think about the role of the regulator in financial services specifically, from one side, they have to have and make sure that there is stability and integrity into the market. And from the other side, at the same time, have competition, which will bring more fair outcomes for consumers. And this is something that, um, you know, these two kind of pillars, let's say, uh, or ideas um, within the regulatory space sometimes can be in conflict, right? Because, you know, if you, if you wish to have more stability and integrity in the sector, that could, you know, obviously jeopardize competition and, and vice versa. And um, we we have seen though that there is you know a small amount of innovation happening uh, at least the, the past decade for example there was an interesting piece of research by the Stockholm uh, School of Economics looking at this. Um, uh, kind of lack of competition in the banking sector. For example, across finance services in 2006, they used OECD data to understand whether uh, that kind of responds to the size of the industry when it comes to expenditure for, for research and development. So there is definitely even um, uh, economic kind of reasons to support that idea. Now, of course, regulators weren't there thinking about openness. Potentially, you can think uh, in terms of APIs, very important tool in this um, in this particular context. And you have you know private APIs uh, that you know kind of uh, help with the interfacing within the same organization. But the key interesting uh, feature there of APIs is that they also can be external APIs. They can be what we call open APIs, and you can have partners or members, or in the regulatory se uh, setting, acquaintances, for example, or public APIs that help you know, spread this information and leverage them for further competition. We did an, an extra analysis on the different elements of openness across APIs. So it's not just about they can be accessed from, from uh, public sources or you know particular partners, but also the, the important thing with APIs that allow you for uh, openness when it comes to functionality. For example, you can share different categories of financial data or what functionalities you can do you know, between read and write APIs, for example, or payment initiation or, or just transactional data. So that's another dimension we've identified. And then API usage. So uh, the, the more bandwidth you share through APIs, the more uh, able you are to, uh, to communicate information in that context. And then API openness also plays at the level of standardization, right? When, when you have open standard, standards for these APIs, you know, that's, that's equally important uh, for, um, for industry participants to be able to access those APIs and consume data from these APIs. And last but not least, you can think about the different kind of data, non-financial data you can have, right? So which could also play and fit into, uh, uh, you know, data consumption for decision making, right? And the benefits that the consumers um, get in the end. And that can also help with uh, uh, financial kind of exclusion in that sense. So from that, we got a lot of inspiration, obviously, and a lot of the financial institutions are thinking about new business models. And I'm sure this is something you've already uh, discussed uh, throughout this conference. And of course, we had the chance to present uh, a few times the last five years or so, because we've done a big piece of research around platform business models in banking, in financial service in general. And so the idea there is obviously that you create a platform and try and, and increase your um, you know, revenues through interactions rather than 
than uh, you know necessarily kind of selling your own products and so on and so forth. And in that sense, APIs become more than just a technology that they can interface, right? They become a software product, which you can uh, price and, and product manage, for example, and, and promote amongst your new breed of customers, which is basically the third parties, uh, or they become boundary resources, right? You can think of them uh, as, a, uh, as a medium or a technology where you can control and coordinate the relationship with external providers and even create platform ecosystems, right? So third parties, party innovators who, who can add value to your platform. That's kind of a big theoretical uh, kind of pre premise or principle, if you want, within the platform theories. Um, last but not least, of course, they can be seen as many contracts because they, they come with documentation. They come with, um, you know, uh, further kind of terms and conditions. And that really liberates a lot of the transaction costs we have within the setting of the platform as well. Now, that kind of entire idea obviously makes you think, uh, you know, if you're a bank, makes you think beyond brokering money, which is kind of the central kind of activity, perhaps, of deposit-taking institutions. And you can think along the lines of, of uh, you know, brokering data. So that the, the idea of the financial institution there kind of moves beyond the, the narrow scope uh, of, of the fiscal, uh, let's say, uh, dimension of, of the business, right? Even though we've been saying for quite uh, some time, and, and I guess it's, 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 uh, it's generally true in finance services that it's predominantly an information business. So data kind of really matter in that context, right? And so when we put all these things together, there are elements that, you know, obviously, um, APIs can really help you strategize the different kind of uh, platform business models you can build. And there, of course, we have uh, industry papers discussing already uh, for, for a while about this. Uh, we even had our own paper uh, like four years ago discussing the, the first kind of uh, categorization or typology of platforms within financial services. And we used theory uh, you know, in academia in that sense to break down uh, the different possibilities one could um, uh, could could have or utilize in their own in their own context, and we even have another paper which is upcoming towards the end of the year discussing uh, you with examples the different platforms that we have seen kind of emerging within financial services. So this is joint work with other professors at Oxford or Work Business School, uh, where it was before, um, uh, and and we we really look to to, to publish these the next uh, the next couple of months. Within that, of course, you know, you need to think about the different variations of platform business models and then kind of think what kind of platform one could leverage or what the elements one should take into account in order to, to, to basically decide on the business model at heart, right? And this is not, um, you know, something we kind of take for granted that a platform business model should be the best one uh, to deploy. Uh, we have seen in many different industries platforms are not necessarily the way to go. So there's a different kind of set of things you need to think about, uh, especially in financial services, quite different from other industries. So you need to identify your strengths, your current position in the market, your economic incentives, as you build, for example, a platform, the influence you, you have and so on and so forth. And maybe there's alternative ways of, uh, of uh, approaching your, um, you know, uh, or organizing economic activity. And another paper we are trying to uh, uh, publish now already submitted in one of the top journals in, in the economics of innovation is going from platforms to more the discussion around innovation ecosystems, right? So we don't necessarily function in the same way as platforms, but, you know, there is an element of interdependence and there is an element of integration amongst different participants in the market, but on both sides, right? So you can have, for example, uh, downstream and upstream kind of components and complementers playing a role in this, and then your uh, central position are as perhaps a coordinator or orchestrator uh, of these kind of innovation production process is to control the different bottlenecks. So we categorize, for example, integration bottlenecks and um, interdependence bottlenecks in that respect. So it's, it's um, you know, it's really important part of your strategy to manage these risks and bottlenecks in the end. Now, one observation we had uh, from uh, a lot of these studies we've done is that, you know, APIs and data openness in the end, particularly when it comes to regulated uh, markets or if there is a regulating uh, framework that uh, basically mandates openness of data, lead to more modular architecture, not just at the firm level, which we've discussed in uh, papers in the past, but also at the market and industry level, right? So this is another paper we referenced here uh, also um, 
basically building on work uh, from other people in academia, you know, Baldwin in particular, where she examines uh, from, from Harvard, where she examines uh, the, the role of architecture in industries. And we have seen that playing out uh, uh, vividly within the banking sector, right? So we have, for example, uh, before PSD2 or data openness in the market, we had more vertically integrated uh, uh, organizing of economic activities. And we think that will lead, we have early signs of how that is leading to a more kind of modular architecture across. And now the question comes to the regulators, and this is kind of a couple of insights I'm going to uh, finish up with, is uh, to think a number of things while you're trying to regulate, um, you know, data sharing in your particular context. So, for example, you need to understand what are the objectives. And then we have seen a bit of variation across different economies globally. For example, in the UK, the story was more about competition. In, in different places around the world, Australia, one could say that it was more about about uh, the customer um, and giving more choice to people to basically choose who has access to their data and how they can share their data for their own benefit. Other considerations around this theme would be whether this should be policy mandated, whether you actually have a hard kind of regulation describe the ways and how you're sharing data or you just you leave it up to the market. Uh, and other issues uh, that are again kind of around the, the regulatory point of view is things that have to do with uh, liability, for example, which many of you know that it's a live debate uh, here in the UK, but also what are the complementary data privacy laws we have in the country or in the region to kind of help us uh, with the sharing of the data and, and outline again, some of the liabilities that play out in this context. Last but not least, of course, is how do you go about to create a data sharing infrastructure. And for that, um, again, there's a recent paper that was just published about a couple months ago, looking at the a case of Canada uh, that was just mentioned just before. Um, you know, and there are certain things that policymakers will look to look at, right? And these kind of link to some of the previous things we said about openness, the different kind of spectrums of openness of APIs uh, and, and how they facilitate competition, but also things around this identity at the customer level or identification at the third party uh, level. And then you'd have other considerations like uh, API adoption and standards, uh, whether that's kind of been enforced and, and what are the standardization efforts around APIs. So the, the UK case is a good example here. And even at the at the level of security, you know, what and how regulation um, or not deals with the authorization authentication standards, right? And, and whether they're uh, standardized permission frameworks or not in place. And I guess the last couple of things one could look at and think about is the, the actual standards for the data themselves that APIs use to communicate. And then again, the example of the UK, but also other economies, we have ISA 20 to 2 being used as a main library and definitions to be used to share these standards. So there is kind of, in the end, some kind of interoperability between systems as well. And the last point we're making in the paper is that one would need to take into account the payment systems and the current infrastructure for and what kind of levels of access they provide. So, so these are some of the elements and key themes that we are kind of describing in depth in this report. Uh, by all means, I cannot spend obviously a huge amount of time here because we have very limited time to discuss each and one of them, but you can find this uh, open resource that was published from the uh, Global Risk Institute in, in the Canadian, um, uh, for the Canadian market. So uh, this is me so far. So I don't have any, Anything else to discuss? So thank you for your attention and Mehdi, back to you in case there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to discuss either through here or uh, perhaps even after the conference. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marcos, uh, for these insights. Uh, we can understand why uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, where you work with them. Um, uh, I, ha I have a quick question, you know, you, you show different models, but is after all, regulations and you know let's say or or standardization made just to reduce transaction cost or is, is does it go beyond that is there any trust aspect in the market in the ability of you know being sure that it will be open how, how do you see this you know uh, economics trust uh, versus the cost of transactions which are the to your mind which has the more impact 
Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. I think standards definitely help in the innovation story. So we have evidence and there is economic theory to suggest that when you have a standardized environment to share information, that really helps with, with innovation because then the barriers to entry in this market, but also interface and integrate with existing systems is much lower. So it can it can help with the economic incentives that people have. You know, of course, there there's other things to take into account, right? So how, for example, how a platform shares these these gains with third parties, and then if you have a very shelfish uh, platform provider or sponsor, for example, uh, this may not work out in the long term. But standards do help with integration with third parties. So we have seen, you know examples uh, from other industries mainly so far on how standards do play a role. And, and of course, there's a long literature within network economics describing the role of standards in the greater setting with, within other finance or other industries. But definitely, I think in terms of um, trust, you know, a, a solid or robust um, kind of framework. And I, I'd like to think, you know, obviously the UK model has been criticized extensively for many, many different reasons and things. But I think one of the key points there was the standards. And we see that standards usually, even if the technology, for example, does not uh, necessarily um you know, kind of survive becomes obsolete in the midterm, standards generally are a good point of entry to flatten competition and create kind of a more level playing field. So both in terms of trust and participa participation in the industry, I think they they do play an important role. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, another uh, question about uh, the concept of uh, API neutrality. I don't know if you ever heard uh, that term, uh, but the idea that by guaranteeing that banks will have no, uh, let's say, uh, ability to uh, seg to do any segregation uh, to their API users, right? So that any accredited company can actually use the API of that the bank will provide. Uh, yeah, do you see an impact into establishing a, a regulation in the market by obliging some banks, like in UK, for example, these nine banks were obliged to let other use APIs or in, in PSD2, like uh, there is no ways to uh, to segregate users versus others. Um, do you see it as a as a good mechanism to in, in, enhance trust in investment into third party providers or fintechs? Yeah, I mean that's a good point. So that that was one of the things that I think has been debated in the UK as well. Uh, the fact that you know nine banks have been. Uh, and forced basically to to comply versus kind of smaller players are not um, really forced to do that. But I guess, you know, one of the key findings there is that a lot of, uh, you know, other institutions beyond the nine um, CMA nine banks, for example, did also use these kind of APIs as a point of entry to create their own ecosystems and platforms, right? So, um, so standardizing these only for the nine banks didn't work in, in a way that kind of limits them somehow or, or puts them on the spot in the corner. Um, I don't know if that's the, if, if that's what you meant with the question of API neutrality. Um, I guess the, the other point there is in terms of, uh, you know, third parties and who is able to participate in these networks. I think, you know, it's, it's good that if you, inf you know, the, the big benefit of actually enforcing uh, this model rather than kind of leaving the market to decide on both in terms of the standards, but also accessibility is that it creates kind of a fair entry for everybody, right? Subject to license, obviously. And that's, I think that's a good thing to have, you know, when it comes to flattening competition in a particular industry. Yeah, for the last question, maybe can you just unshare your screen so we see our heads better uh, discussing? Uh, yes. Last question is that, is there any study as a proposal for the calculated fees that banks and fintechs can apply as a common standard? No. Um, yeah, not, not that I can think of. I mean, one of the things we are trying to do now, uh, for example, um, and we are kind of reaching out to the uh, open banking kind of implementation and in the UK to see if there is any data they could share uh, is to try and see what has been the economic impact at the firm level of, of the implementation of some of these APIs. Um, so the question there is, for example, whether, you know, even by creating a platform-based business model, whether there is enough rents to justify a new kind of breed of business model and, and bring in some profits from these kind of third-party interactions. Then I guess, you know, from that, you can work out the pricing uh, of, of API access as well. But, you know, there is still a bit of, of obscurity and it's not really clear how these kind of third-party interactions would lead 
uh, you know, banks um, into having new kind of new revenue stream that would justify an entire new business model in that sense, right? Um, so in theory, that is very beneficial. We have seen Apple, for example, benefited immensely from an innovation ecosystem around it. But in financial services, it's not 100% clear where this is going to happen in the end, right? So we'd still, new, uh, we'd, we'd still need, need new evidence to, um, to see how that works in action in terms of, of revenues and profitability. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Marcos, uh, uh, about it. We always want to invite research, you know, to get to get a glimpse of what's happening in the future, right? And you know, as Alan Kay used to say, the best way to predict the to predict the future is to invent it. So <laughs> we hope that uh, over That's the right. last few days we shared some ideas to invent it together. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you for being with us. I will just share.